Hi, guys. So we often talk about on this show, we talk about the left's effort to mainstream what they call gender affirming care or the gender affirming model of healthcare for children who suffer from gender disorders. Now, gender affirming is their euphemistic term. I would reject the term, but it's what it's what the left calls this model of healthcare. And what they mean by gender affirming is this pipeline where children who feel uncomfortable in their bodies or children who are influenced by the social contagion of rapid onset gender dysphoria and claim that they identify as a gender that is incongruent with their biological sex, they're put in this pipeline where first they socially transition and then they are put on puberty blocking hormones, then they are put on cross sex hormones, then they are referred for surgical transition, which is the so-called top and bottom surgery. And one of the arguments that the left collectively makes in favor of this gender affirming model of care, they tell us that if we dissent from this model of care, that we are actively harming these children. We are causing them to commit suicide. We are Uh, reducing them to essentially having poor mental health because they are conflicted with this with this gender, this incongruent gender and and body. And very recently, on a substack called Reality's Last Stand, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute by the name of Lior Sapir, we talked about him and his piece briefly on one of the pieces that we did for VIPs on locals. He went through all of the studies, the data, the statistics, and the claims by the leaders on the left that claim that putting children on puberty-blocking hormones results in a better mental health outcome. And so Lior is here with us today because I want to dive into the weeds on this. This is the underpinning of this effort in the medical community to put children on these these, these drugs, which are not FDA approved for the purpose of, quote unquote, suppressing puberty or putting a pause button on puberty while they explore their gender identity. Leo Sapir from the Manhattan Institute. Thanks for joining me. It's good to see you. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for having me. So your piece was outstanding. I, 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 I told everyone who watches and listens to this show when we talked about it, I think it was last week, I told them to read your entire thing. But I'm really excited to talk to you today because... I, I'd like you to first introduce yourself because this is quite an undertaking that you have, um, that you've decided to make your quest. This is quite an undertaking to take some of the top influencers who are propagating this information in the name of medicine about transgender youth and say, listen, you're wrong and here's why. So give us a little background on who you are. Sure. So um, I got my PhD in political science, believe it or not. Um, and um, I wrote my dissertation on the Obama administration's uh, regulations under Title IX on the subject of transgender student uh, students in schools. Um, and right around 2020, when I was doing a postdoc, um, I started to really get sucked into the metal t- medical debates themselves. Um, and I started to notice that, you know, there's very little there. Um, you know, the studies are weak. Um, they're poorly controlled. You don't really need uh, that much expertise to understand um, what they do and do not find. In fact, in most cases, the authors themselves will will tell you that. Um, but I was especially struck, uh, and still am, by the extent to which uh, our institutions of knowledge gatekeeping, by which I mean the medical journals, the peer review process, you know, more popular magazines like Scientific American, um, have been completely captured on this issue. Um, at minimum, they fail to report faithfully and honestly on the findings of uh, the studies that they cite. Um, and I think no less important, they fail to provide their readers with a comprehensive, accurate picture of the whole state of the research, uh, a comprehensive understanding of where we are um, medically, scientifically, in our understanding of these um, of these phenomena as they affect youth. So, you know, people often ask me, why, how, you know, you're a political scientist, you're not a doctor, why are you speaking on this issue? Um, my simple answer to that is the science is not that complicated for anybody who has a basic understanding of, you know, of research design. Um, the bigger, the much bigger question here is the, is the question of institutional capture. And that's a question for political scientists. That's not a question for doctors. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you use this phrase, institutional capture. Back in January of this year, Psychology Today, which is one of the preeminent medical journals, right? This is, uh, I guess now, quote unquote, a reputable medical journal, as opposed to, this isn't a blog online. This is not someone's Twitter screed. This means that this, this, this 
research that's published in Psychology Today is supposed to be peer reviewed. So back in January, a doctor by the name of Dr. Jack Turbin wrote an article claiming that it's a meta-analysis, right? He claimed that this, this group of 16 studies about children with gender dysphoria and what happens when they're put on puberty-blocking medication, that it his quote is, results in favorable mental health outcomes. When you first encountered this article, what tipped you off that he was misrepresenting the actual studies? Well, part of it was just my familiarity with some of the studies, um, which I kind of immediately saw that he was misrepresenting. Some of it was my familiarity familiarity with Turbin himself, um, who I think is um, in a field known for having a lot of kind of quack doctors and activists um, with medical degrees. I think he's un uh, uh, unique even in that field um, in the extent of the bad faith. With who, is, who is Jack Turbin? Yeah. Uh, so Jack Turbin is a child psychiatrist um, uh, currently at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, and, um, you know, he's done um, research in this field. He's published a number of papers. Um, some of them are so uh, egregiously flawed. It's a surprise that they even got through the peer review process. I can give you an example of that later on if you'd like. He's become one of the leading figures of the gender affirming movement. He's um, uh, frequently cited in the mainstream media. Um, and he, he's made several appearances in federal courts testifying on behalf of students who sue their schools or, um, or rather uh, on against states that are trying to regulate gender affirming uh, interventions. Um, but, you know, I, he's, he's just one of these kind of activist doctors who uh, is so caught up in the narrative, is so ideologically blinded um, uh, that he just fails to, uh, to to report honestly on the findings of his own studies um, and to report honestly to the media on what the state of the evidence actually is. Um, so maybe if I could just give an example of his recent paper in pediatrics, which is the peer-reviewed journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is uh, perhaps the most uh, captured of our institutions, medical institutions on this issue. Um, the paper tried to uh, claim that social contagion, which you mentioned in your introduction, um, that it's not happening, that it's not the reason why, you know, uh, 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 why the number of, of, of kids uh, identifying as transgender and presenting at gender clinics has skyrocketed in recent years. Um, and the way that he tries to debunk it is, is by saying, look, in these two particular years, 2017 and 2019, there were more boys than girls showing up at these clinics. I mean, of course, biological boys and girls showing up at these clinics. Um, and um, he relied on a survey that he himself has said in the past, you cannot, from this survey, you cannot infer anything about the biological sex of respondents. Um, and not only that, but he provides three citations to his claim that you can, in fact, infer the biological sex of respondents. Um, and it only takes about an hour for any reader to um, comb through these three articles and see that none of them say anything of the, that sort. Um, and then finally, the, the uh, researchers who designed the survey in question themselves cautioned against using the survey to infer anything about the biological sex of respondents. So based on those three pieces of evidence, um, which include, as I said, Turbin's own claim from the past that you can't do what he now is doing in 2022, um, he just ru ran roughshod over all of that and ignored it and just said, I'm just going to do it anyway because he wants to disprove social contagion theory. And of course, this got through the peer reviewed process. How is beyond me. Um, and it was me immediately uh, kind of plugged into this media echo chamber that he has helped to create um, where, you know, all these mainstream media news outlets were just kind of repeatedly citing uh, his study saying there's no social contagion. It's a it's a total fiction. It doesn't happen. Um, all these kids are just born that way. They know who they are. They deserve their hormones, this, that, and the other. Um, and then once it got picked up in the mainstream media, it, it kind of took on a life of its own. Then you have journalists citing other journalists, citing other journalists, and, and it becomes uh, idea laundering. I think that's a pretty appropriate word for, for what's going on here. It's idea laundering. So you said before something really interesting. I know it's a slight tangent here, but you said that the American Academy of Pediatrics is captured institutionally more than almost anything else. I want to ask you the why question. Because yeah. it's obvious to me when the CDC and the FDA are captured because these government bureaucrats then cash out. They get these cushy big pharma jobs. Big pharma is captured because they make profit. Why is the American Academy of Pediatrics captured institutionally on the issue of, of transgender ideology? Yeah, 
that's a good question, and it's one I'm still trying to figure out. Um, it's, it's it's a complicated question. So let me kind of give a few basic thoughts. Just to give your listeners kind of a, a, a basic background here, um, in 2018, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, uh, published in a non-peer-reviewed section of its pediatrics journal um, an article by a young doctor who was then, I think, just finishing up his residency. So this guy had um, almost no clinical experience. Um, uh, and the article basically claimed that the approach taken by um, um, gender dysphoria experts in clinics around the world, known as watchful waiting, which is when you don't socially transition children until puberty, um, because the vast majority of kids who exhibit these gender dysphoric behaviors um, come to terms with their body and their sex by puberty. So it's, it's, it's wrong and harmful to transition them. And this young doctor, Jason Rafferty, basically writes this article saying, no, that's all wrong. Um, watchful waiting is in fact a form of conversion therapy. And, um, and the only ethically and medically responsible thing to do is to transition kids the moment they declare themselves to be of the op uh, opposite sex. Um, needless to say, all of his citations were complete distortions of the underlying evidence. You could see that simply by looking at the citations themselves. Some of them explicitly say only watchful waiting is the, is the uh, relevant approach. Um, and more importantly, he omitted all the studies that don't support his contention that watchful waiting is conversion therapy. Um, so it's on the basis of this one non-peer-reviewed, highly flawed study that the AAP in 2018 came to its conclusion that gender-affirming care is, as it likes to say now, medically necessary and life-saving. Um, and I should mention that um, other American medical organizations, including the American uh, uh, Medical Association, um, they don't cite uh, research of their own when they come out in front of gender, uh, in favor of gender-affirming care. They basically cite the American Academy of Pediatrics and um, one more organization, which is the Endocrine Society, which has itself rated its, the quality of its own evidence as being of, quote, low or very low certainty. Um, so that's just by way of background, okay? These medical organizations have issued policy recommendations on the basis of extremely weak studies. Um, so why is the AAP captured? Well, I mean, there's a number of reasons, Liz. I mean, one is, you know, what we're seeing in the AAP is part and parcel of what we're seeing across other institutions of, in American life, which is a kind of ideological takeover by a very young, um, very, very left-wing, very uh, woke uh, generation of activists coming out of elite universities. We see this in um, editorial boards at mainstream media. We've, we've seen this at the New York Times. Uh, we see this in corporations, um, uh, and, and, and we're seeing this now in the medical profession itself, um, both at the level of medical education, where science requirements are, are being dispensed with in favor of social justice curricula, and we're seeing it in professional medical organizations like the AAP. So part of the story here is um, a young, uh, you know, highly ideological, highly motivated, and very well-organized group of activists um, who are really good at kind of bullying everybody else into submission or at least into silence. Um, so it's a kind of collective action problem, right? Where you have a majority of pediatricians or at least of, uh, let's say of, of doctors in general who would like to see evidence-based care, um, but then you have a minority of activists who are very vocal and well-organized and know how to dictate the tone and the policy. Um, but part of it, I think, is that uniquely uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, it's a heavily female-dominated field, two-thirds. Um, uh, there are, and, and um, in female-dominated fields, uh, in, you know, pediatrics, psychology and psychiatry, and um, education and teaching, um, understandably, there tends to be a much stronger emphasis on kindness and compassion and empathy um, and that's usually the the you know the, the tone uh, in which these arguments are made, right? That if you disagree, it's not that you have a reasonable interpretation of um, inherently ambiguous studies. It's that you're cruel, you're lacking in compassion. And I think those that kind of messaging um, is uniquely uh, potent in an environment that is um, uh, female dominated. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing um, these particular fields of the of the medical establishment as well as schools being taken over by this stuff. Again, it's not that um, it's not that women yeah. are all on board with this stuff. On the contrary, I work with a lot of women who are, are at the forefront of pushing back against it. 
Um, it's just that these fields tend to be uh, uh, ones in which empathy can more easily be weaponized. Yeah. And I maybe the real question is, how did a doctor like Jason Rafferty get his shoddily sourced, non-peer-reviewed article published on the AAP and who at the AAP allowed that to be published? Because if that really is the beginning of the institutional capture, then those questions maybe need to be answered. Because there, you, you, mentioned, you, know, you mentioned evidence-based medicine, but standard of care is very important when it comes to AAP. If doctors, if pediatricians across the country don't follow the standards of care, then they're liable in a court of law if they have a bad outcome. So anything the AAP says, essentially, pediatricians are required to follow. And so there's certainly an ideological motivation to have the AAP recommend recommend what someone who is, you know, someone whose agenda is the transing of children, um, they would certainly be incentivized to have the AAP dictate this as a standard of care. Right. Um, so I, I should just mention, I think the fact that the Rafferty, first of all, the Rafferty paper was not technically peer reviewed. Um, other papers since the Rafferty paper have been peer reviewed and they have been very weak as well. So the peer review process there is, does seem to be broken. And I, I don't think most pediatricians understand that. Um, one thing that we discovered, for example, over the last couple of years is that um, the AAP recommends, um, or pediatrics, I'm sorry, the, the Board of Pediatrics recommends certain journal articles as best of the year. Um, and it recommended, um, I believe it was Jack Turbin's article uh, as best of the year. And when we inquired as to why that's the case, it turned out that the editorial board recommends best of the year based on the number of clicks and downloads, as opposed to the quality of the underlying oh article. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and you know, this is something that I imagine a lot of pediatricians, a lot of doctors, and certainly most parents um, are unaware of. Um, you know, especially when you're dealing with an area of clinical practice that requires specialization, um, such as treatment of gender dysphoric youth, most pediatricians who are not specialists in that particular area are understandably inclined to say, look, this is not my specialty. Um, I'm going to defer to the best practices of my professional organization because I assume that they're doing their job at gatekeeping, at knowledge gatekeeping, at making sure that only the best evidence is allowed to speak. Um, so a lot of this is kind of this broken chain of trust, right? And, and that I think is characteristic, not just of the medical, of the problem of, of wokeness in medicine, but in general in academia and, and, and all forms in which knowledge gets to dictate policy, is that there's this chain of trust that we, we rely on certain mechanisms, certain processes like peer review, um, and the fact that these uh, um, mechanisms are not working as they should uh, is a huge problem and one that we often discover when it's too late. Yeah, and we're told simultaneously that if we are not part of the AAP, if we are not doctors, then we're not qualified to be skeptical of what the quote-unquote experts tell us. I, I want to go back to the Jack Turbin article for a second, though. I, so there, he based this on 16 studies. Can, we don't have to go through all 16 of them, but I want to go through some of them, if you would, and tell me what the actual study was and how he represented it and how you debunked it. Because pe people want to understand this so that they can have conversations with their family and their friends and local school boards and politicians, not just saying like, oh, I know this is wrong, but they want to be able to articulate the why. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so let me divide the studies into two groups. Um, the first group would include the, the papers published um, uh, uh, under what's known as the Dutch study or the Dutch protocol. And these are the first and second studies that Turbin um, lists. And I'll, I'll get to those in particular it's because that is um, that remains the gold standard. That is supposed to be the highest quality evidence that we have to date um, of the benefits of gender affirming interventions. And as I'll, as I'll show you, it's, uh, it doesn't come anywhere near um, being good evidence. Um, the second body of evidence um, uh, includes all the subsequent studies that have been done um, in the 10, 15 years since these studies came out. Um, and those studies, you could say, fall into two camps. Um, one camp includes studies that show no, um, no improvement in mental health, right? So um, kids got puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones and, and all relevant measures of mental health outcomes anxiety, depression, suicidality, all these things, um, there was no statistically significant improvement. Um, the second camp of studies, again, were under the second category of studies, um, meaning not the Dutch studies. The second camp in, in the second category um, does show improvement, 
but there is no way to isolate the effects of hormones from those of psychotherapy, right? So these were kids who were getting um, counseling, psychotherapy, at the, at the same time they were getting um, uh, uh, hormones. Um, typically in order to qualify for ho hormones, they also had to have a, uh, a supportive family background. And so there really is no way to know whether the hormones are what are are what's causing the improvement in mental health or the psychotherapy. Um, so uh, you cannot infer any causal claim, right? You cannot say that hormones are causing improvement in mental health, which is what Jack Turbin is trying to do in this study. And I should mention that of those studies, most for the most part, the authors are pretty straightforward about this. They will say things like, no causal inference can be made from our uh, based on our research design. Um, but, you know, Turbin omits all of that relevant information and basically misleads his readers into thinking that, um, that, that the authors of those studies did in fact find causal influence of hormones on mental health. So I just want to clarify that my critique here was not necessarily of the studies themselves. It was the way in which Turbin is interpreting the studies and popularizing them um, to the media and to the medical profession. So with that out of the way, I mean, let me just kind of get into the, I, I think most important here are going to be the Dutch studies because that remains the gold standard. Um, so this refers to a, a, a long-term um, cohort study that began in the Netherlands in the 1990s and continued um, through the 2000s. Um, and um, the study really suffers from a number of uh, fatal weaknesses. Um, and I go through these in my, in my uh, piece reviewing Jack Turpin, so I'm not gonna go into it in great depth here, but I'll just say um, one problem is uh, just bias in selection. So the way in which the uh, researchers set up their research design um, was in such a way as to select in advance only those cases that, um, um, that, that where puberty blockers did not show, um, did not result in, in mental health distress. Let me interject really quick because I want to make sure I want to make sure that I'm clear on this and that that our listeners are clear on this. So tell me what the Dutch studies were set up to do. Who were they studying and what was the point? Because if we're going to understand the bias of them, we need to know like what the studies are. OK, good. Yes. OK, so um, let me go back a couple steps here um, until the 1990s or really late 80s. It was generally understood that, you know, uh, these kind of what were known at the time as sex reassignment procedures. Um, for a condition that was then called gender identity disorder, um, if they should be done at all, and there were people who thought and still think today that they should not be done, but if they were to be done at all, they should only be done on adults for obvious reasons. Um, in the 19, late 1980s and 1990s, a group of researchers at the Free University of Amsterdam said, look, um, adult transsexuals, that's the word that they used, adult transsexuals um, tend to uh, still have serious distress associated with their body, and it is the body itself that causes the distress, specifically the secondary sex characteristics, breasts, facial hair, um, big bones and musculature, all these kinds of things, right? So especially when it comes to boys, um, and, and uh, pretty much all of their um, patients were boys who participated in the study, especially when it comes to boys, preventing puberty, um, it was thought, would uh, reduce the likelihood of suffering on account of these irreversible changes that puberty uh, brings to the male body. So that was the rationale. Um, and you know they thought that if they could really carefully assess um, eligibility for participation in the study and screen out all the kids who had other you know, co-occurring mental health problems and do this on the basis of an informed consent model with the support and, and, and approval of the parents, um, that they could really uh, produce better mental health outcomes in the long run. So that's that's what the Dutch study tried to do. Um, and it really had kind of these strict conditions for eligibility. For example, and I mention this because um, one of the critiques of the Dutch study that I get into is that to the extent you think it's a good study, that it actually means that it's inapplicable to the vast majority of teenagers showing up these days in American clinics. Um, so, uh, again, so what, one of the uh, criteria up for eligibility to participate in the study um, was you had to have gender dysphoria that was diagnosed in childhood, meaning before, before puberty, and the dysphoria had to persist into puberty uh, and even intensify. Why was that important? 
because the Dutch understood that puberty is itself a stage in development that clarifies who you are, what your body is, the kinds of changes that you're going through. Um, and, uh, and puberty was, uh, was assumed to, to, uh, to cause desistance, meaning to help um, children um, uh, stop, uh, you know, uh, rejecting their body and identifying as the opposite sex, right? So, um, so that was a fundamental condition. They had to have early onset gender dysphoria and had to continue and even intensify into adolescence. By contrast, the vast majority of, um, uh, you know, minors showing up for gender transition procedures nowadays in the UK and the United States um, are adolescent onset, or what's known as what you mentioned earlier as rapid onset, right? Um, these conditions did not start before puberty. Um, they usually start around puberty or a little bit after. And so therefore, there, um, you know, if you're not, unless you're a, an ideologue, um, the first question you would ask is, well, they're probably brought on because of puberty, because of all the psychosocial, you know, stressors of, of going through through puberty, especially for girls. Um, so that's just one example of how um, uh, the Dutch protocol, based on the Dutch study, uh, to the extent that it's even a good protocol, meaning science-based, um, is actually inapplicable to the vast majority of kids. And I should mention, one of the authors of the Dutch protocol said last year, in 2021, he said, other countries, and he meant also, and probably especially the United States, are, and I quote, blindly adopting our research. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Dutch and a number of their uh, counterparts in Finland and in Sweden have since also spoken out and, say, and said, you know, what, uh, what's going on in the United States is just, um, there's no evidence for it. Um, it's literally experimentation on children. Um, and if, you know, if, if gender affirming doctors in the United States um, appeal to the Dutch protocol, to the Dutch studies and claim to be following those studies, um, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're uh, they're lying um, because that's just not the case. So these 16 studies, I guess, setting aside Jack Turbin's misrepresentation of them for a second, do any of these 16 studies show that putting children on puberty blocking hormones or giving them cross sex hormones or having them undergo surgical transition? Are there any of these studies that show that that helps the mental health status of youth, gender disordered youth? Um, the answer is no. Um, I, I should mention surgery was not in any of the studies that Jack Turbin discussed. It's only hormones. And that's usually the focus of the debate because um, hormones, meaning puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, are usually the, uh, um, the, the step that precedes surgery. Um, so, if you, you know, how, what our policy is about, sur about hormones will um, dictate downstream what our policy is on surgery. But um, the short answer to your question is no. Uh, there isn't a single long-term study um, that can show reliably that hormones cause improvement in mental health, not one. And that's why I should mention Sweden, Finland, and the UK over the past two years have conducted comprehensive reviews of evidence, which is, uh, or systematic reviews of evidence, which is a method of evidence review that's designed to prevent cherry picking of studies, which is exactly what the AAP has done, um, in order to evaluate the entire body of medical research on a, uh, on a question. In this case, um, uh, do puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones improve mental health? And all three countries, health, the health authorities in those three countries came to the same conclusion. There is no evidence that the benefits of these interventions outweigh the risks. No evidence. And so over the past two years, Sweden and Finland have dramatically scaled back in their policies. They've dramatically scaled back um, hormonal interventions for minors. They have basically said, we're only going to allow it in extreme cases um, that adhere to the Dutch protocol and in uh, uh, research settings, because we, we want to know, ultimately, this is an experiment, and we want to know what the long-term mental health consequences are of giving these kids puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. So they've drastically narrowed um, uh, eligibility. Um, they, uh, these countries don't allow surgeries. We're pretty much the only country that allows that, um, possibly in Canada. I'm not entirely sure about that. But um, we're pretty much the only country that allows kids to undergo surgery, both top and bottom. Um, and, um, and recently, uh, I was pleased to find out that the UK last week um, following the very damning um, CAS report, the report by Dr. Hilary Cass, who's the head of the British version of the AAP, 
um, on its own main gender clinic, the Tavistock Clinic, um, uh, they said that social transition, meaning, you know, think of what schools do when they adopt a student's preferred name and pronouns um, and let students use their um, preferred restrooms and sports teams, right? Social transition, according to the UK's National Health Service, is not just an act of support. It's not just a form of kindness that adults, including teachers, can express towards kids, but rather, according to the NHS, based on evidence reviews now, it's, a, it's an active psychosocial intervention. Those are the words that the NHS uses and, and that Dr. Cass used. It's an active intervention that is very likely to change the course of a child's development. Um, and if you want, we can get, a, you know, there's 12 studies that prove this, or at least show that it's highly likely to be true. Um, and so that means that the NHS now strongly discourages social transition in pre-pubertal children, meaning children before the age roughly of 11 or 12. And even for adolescents, for teenagers, it says social transition only with a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and only on the basis of informed consent. That's important because informed consent is usually a requirement of risky medical treatments, right? You don't need informed consent to take Tylenol, um, but you do need it to undergo risky medical treatments. And the, the, uh, the UK is now considering social transition, right, where no puberty blockers are involved. Um, even that it's considered to be, uh, it's considering to be a risky medical intervention. And I just want to emphasize for your listeners, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot exaggerate how important this is for what's going on in American schools these days, because we are seeing school districts across the country adopt policies in the name of, so to speak, inclusion and safety, in which children, even from the age of kindergarten, and we have hard evidence of this. And if anybody doesn't believe me, I urge you to go to Christopher Rufo's website. He's a, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute as well. And he's been compiling the evidence on this. It's right there in, 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 in school policies and in presentations that, that they give. Um, it's, we have hard evidence of this, that schools are actively encouraging teachers and teachers themselves are actively socially transitioning children in many cases without notifying or getting consent from their parents. And I just wanna emphasize, this is a medical decision. It's not just an expression of kindness or inclusivity or safety. And to the extent that teachers are doing this uh, to, to children behind parents' back, it is one of the most wildly irresponsible things that I have seen um, in my life, frankly. Wow, it's hard, it's hard to believe that this is happening right under our noses when the science contradicts it. Since you published your rebuttal to Dr. Jack Turbin's Psychology Today article, did he respond to you? No, Turbin doesn't respond. Um, he, that, that's who he is. Um, he's kind of cloistered in his echo chamber. Um, and I, I, you know, I, one of the questions I keep asking myself is, does he know he's lying uh, or, is this, or is this incompetence? I, I, I'm not sure. And to some extent, I don't care. Um, but he hasn't responded to me, at least directly. Um, what did happen after I published my my analysis of his of his analysis um, is that um, four days later, Psychology Today issued a correction. Um, they corrected four four of the claims he makes in uh, for four of the studies. Um, they also made two stealth edits, which I thought was very interesting um, because one of the claims that, for example, one of the claims that Turbin makes in his article is that. Uh, one of the studies that showed no mental health benefits from hormones, Turbin says, you know, uh, we can ignore this study because the, the number of patients, a number of subjects that it included in the study were so, uh, was so small that we can't really infer anything from it. But then he goes on to um, celebrate studies that have uh, um, uh, cohort, patient cohorts that, uh, uh, that are equally small and in some cases even smaller. And he says, oh, these studies that did show mental health benefits, we should um, consider to be valid. So um, Psychology Today stealth edited his claim about small studies out because it was a glaring hypocrisy there. Um, and they issued four explicit corrections. And as I showed um, in, I think, uh, I think in one of my Twitter feeds, um, uh, they, it, there were a number of other corrections too. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there, there were other corrections that should have been made, but weren't. Um, uh, and, and some of them serious corrections, for example, uh, uh, on the Dutch study. 
Um, so they corrected the article to some extent. Um, now, if you go through the studies, um, you know, it, it, they still have Jack Turbin's summary of the article, which is that 16 studies overall show that um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, quote, result in, unquote, better outcomes. Um, you know, at least half the studies show the opposite of that, or at least don't show anything. And I would say all of the studies <laughs> don't show anything. None of them show um, uh, causal evidence of improvement. Um, but the very fact that psychology today can allow Turbin to use the language of results in, which is highly misleading because it suggests a causal relationship, is just deeply irresponsible. And it's public information of the first degree. It is. And if it weren't for people like you who do this kind of analysis, I think a lot of parents wouldn't be aware of the science. And a lot of people who see what's happening in our country, see what's happening to our children in the name of the transgender ideology in our country, wouldn't know the nuances of the truth because the left loves to say science is king. They love to sling, well, the science shows X, Y, Z, but when it comes down to it, it's uh, the left who is mis who is misrepresenting or outright lying about the science Lior, thank you so much for being on the show. Where can people find your work? I know that I know that a lot of people are going to want to read your entire piece and a lot of people are going to want to follow your work. Where can they find you? Sure. So the best the best thing to do honestly is to follow me on Twitter because I post pretty much all of my not pretty much all of my work on Twitter. Um, but if you want a direct source, um, uh, City Journal is the best place to go. Um, you can visit my my um, my personal page at um, at the Manhattan Institute. Um, or you can go to City Journal and uh, you'll see a list of all of my articles there. Great. We will post a link to your Twitter account and to City Journal and the Manhattan Institute when this when this interview airs. Or thank you for sitting here and talking to me about this. It was uh, really illuminating. I appreciate it. Thanks, Liz, for having me on the show. I appreciate it. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.